All right, so um, our setting is, as Amos tells us there in the first verse, the words of Amos, who was among the herdmen of Tekoa. Amos was a shepherd. Uh, he's not a, he's not a, a, a priest uh, like Jeremiah or Ezekiel. He is not a professional prophet. Uh, he's not a preacher. He's not a Levite. He's a, he's a shepherd. He's a herdman. And so it says, uh, the words of Amos, who was among the herdmen of Tekoa, which is a little town in Judah, south of Jerusalem, which he saw concerning Israel in the days of Uzziah, king of Judah, and in the days of Jeroboam, the son of Joash, king of Israel, two years before the earthquake. Now, we don't know, um, we don't know exactly what this earthquake was about, but if you want to keep your finger there and turn to Zechariah, just over a, a few chapters to the right, chapter 14, this earthquake was a big deal because Zechariah is going to mention it as well and he's going to give us the setting of it once again being in the days of Uzziah and so Zechariah 14 5 and ye shall flee to the valley of the mountains for the valley of the mountains shall reach unto Azael yea ye shall flee like as ye fled from before the earthquake in the days of Uzziah king of Judah and the Lord my God shall come and all the saints with thee so this was a big deal uh, uh, this this earthquake and so he, he tells us this is the setting two years before that earthquake took place this is uh, Amos's prophecy so let's remember what, what, what's happened so you, you've got the kingdom and during the days of Saul you had some prophets during the days of David you have some prophets Gad and Nathan and some others that speak into David's life after David, along comes Solomon, uh, from, uh, and you've got some prophets to speak into Solomon's life as well. Then after Solomon, the, the kingdom splits when his son becomes king. Rehoboam comes and he splits the kingdom in half, and the northern tribes become the nation of Israel, and the southern tribe becomes Judah, Judah and Benjamin together. Okay, And, and so you have this split. And so Uzziah is the king of Judah at this time, and Jeroboam the second is the king of Israel at the time of Amos. So after this, you you go along for a while, and then you have, after the days of Rehoboam, then you have Elijah come along and begin to prophesy. And he comes along when Ahab becomes king in Israel. And the the darker the days get, the more evil the kingdoms get, the more courageous the prophets get. So you have Elijah do a lot. But he doesn't write anything down. Somebody writes it down about him, but Elijah is not necessarily a writing prophet. Then after Elijah is Elisha. After the death of Elisha comes probably Joel. Joel and Jonah are pretty close to each other somewhere in there, but I personally think that Joel is the earliest. We studied Joel on Sunday mornings. Last week we studied Jonah. Jonah is a little bit different than Amos because Jonah is specifically, he does prophesy to Israel because we have some of his prophecies recorded in the book of Kings. But his main mission is to Nineveh. And so <clears throat> Nineveh is rising as a power. And yet Jonah goes and he preaches, and you have a massive revival, of a, a citywide, nationwide revival for the Ninevites during the days of Jonah. I think what God was doing was giving Israel a little more time. So he has revival take place in Assyria. The Assyrians stopped killing everybody for a while, maybe 30, 40 years, 20 years, something like that. They chill out. When they chill out, that allows Israel to go through a time of incredible peace, incredible prosperity, and uh, victory. They have victory over their, you know, their rivals, Syria and the Philistines, and you know all the all the local rivals for them. But this major superpower of Assyria, God puts the skids on their their great growth by having a revival take place, and they truly repent it. So so they repent. And that buys Israel a little more time. But when Amos comes on the scene, I want you to see this. This is really important. He's going to prophesy primarily to the northern kingdom, to Israel. And Israel is doing good. Israel is powerful. 
Israel is wealthy. Israel is partying it up. They've been victorious in their battles. Uh, and man, they are worshiping the golden calves. And they think there'll never be another poor day. Stock market's doing great. Oil price is cheap. Everything's great. I mean, they're just doing great. Everything's wonderful. And Amos is a shepherd. He's a herdsman. And he loves the Lord. He knows his word. And he's looking at two things primarily in his nation. Actually, the nation above him. Because he's from Judah. But he's looking at two things primarily. Number one, idolatry. Israel is idolatrous. They worship the golden calves at Jeroboam the first initiated at Dan and Bethel. Okay? Number two, they are corrupt. Their politicians are corrupt. Their judges are corrupt. And they, they can be bought. And so they don't execute justice. Uh, they punish people who shouldn't be punished. And they let crooks go free. And so I think it fits our country to a T. I mean, I can see this cowboy walking in out of the pasture and saying, this is what you're doing. Okay, so that's Amos. So you see him come in. He's got his shepherd's crook in his hand. He smells like sheep. And God sends him to prophesy. Okay, and so verse 2. And he said, the Lord will roar from Zion. You know, Amos is one of those guys who's heard a lion roar. And you talk about something that would be terrifying. It doesn't matter whether it's an African lion like he would have encountered or whether it's a mountain lion. Anybody ever heard a mountain lion squall? Sounds just like a woman screaming. And I've never actually heard it myself. I have heard an African lion roar standing for me to that back wall from me. But everybody in my family has heard the, the mountain lions. And it usually happens at night once it's dark. Sounds exactly like a woman screaming at the top of her lungs. And it is a blood-curdling, piercing sound that terrifies you. Well, you can, you, you can see Amos, he's, he's herded sheep his whole life. He's heard lions roar, and he's had to protect his flocks from these lions. And so, so that's the way that he sees. The, the, the lion is a predator, and he roars when he knows he's got something to get, right? And so... So Amos has been in a situation where there's a lion and he sees Amos's sheep and he wants them. And he relates that to the Lord. And he says, The Lord will roar from Zion and utter His voice from Jerusalem. And the inhabitants of the shepherds shall mourn and the top of Carmel shall wither. So uh, it, you, you mourn when the lion roars because unless you are like David and you can smite him uh, he's going to take some of your sheep and he says that's what God's going to do God is going to he's going to unleash fury upon the nations thus saith the Lord so Amos he comes in and he starts prophesying he says the Lord's going to roar like a lion and this is what he says for three transgressions of Damascus and for four Amos is going to use that one two three four five six seven eight he's going to use that eight times in in this and so it's kind of like uh, and and we see that in the proverbs too he's going to give them four he, he says god's giving you four shots but he says it in a poetic form for three transgressions and for four so it's like god has told you again and again and again and one more time so he's giving you more than three strikes you're out he's giving you four strikes and now you're out so thus saith the Lord, for three, for three transgressions of Damascus and for four, I will not turn away the punishment thereof. Now, Damascus is the capital of Syria. So here's the first uh, pronouncement of judgment against Syria. Not Assyria. Assyria is in the Tigris-Euphrates Valley. Syria is north and east of Israel, right where it is today. Okay. So he says... I will not turn away the punishment thereof, verse 3, because they have threshed Gilead with threshing instruments of iron. Gilead is the land of Israel where Reuben, Gad, and the half-tribe of Manasseh settled on the east side of the Jordan River. So that's straight south of Syria. So Syria is invading the area of Gilead. And he says, they've threshed it with threshing instruments of iron. A threshing instrument is what you drag over your wheat. You take and cut the wheat, you bundle it 
in sheaves and you stand it up and let it dry. Then you bring the sheaves into the threshing floor and you drag a threshing instrument over it to separate the wheat from the chaff. He says, that's what it's like, what the Syrians have done to the people of Gilead. But I will send a fire into the house of Hazael, that's the king of Syria, which shall devour the palaces of Ben-Hadad. And I will break also the bar of Damascus and cut off the inhabitant from the plain of Avon. And him that holdeth the scepter from the house of Eden, all of these are, are areas and towns in Damascus. And the people of Syria shall go into captivity unto Kir, saith the Lord. Now Kir is an Assyrian city. So the Assyrians are going to do to the Syrians the same thing they're going to do to Israel a little bit later on. Okay. Before we go on, let me just remind you, when God spoke to Elijah on Mount Horeb, He gave him three tasks. He said, I want you to go and anoint Hazael, king of Syria. That's this guy that he's talking about here. I want you to go anoint Jehu, king of Israel. And I want you to make Elisha prophet in your stead. Okay? And he didn't get all that done. He died, or he went to heaven to be with... The the Lord picked him up in his chariot. But Elisha sent uh, a prophet to anoint Jehu, and Elisha anointed Hazael. And if you remember the story when we studied it, when he did that, he started crying. He stared at him for a long time until he was embarrassed. Elisha just stared at Hazael. And he finally looked at him and he said, "What, what are you doing? And finally Elisha started crying. And he said, because I know what you're going to do to the people of Israel. Well, that's what Amos is talking about. What that Syrian king did to the Israelite people. Now, God is going to judge them for what they've done. Okay? So there's the first judgment, Syria. At this point, all the people of Israel are going, yeah, get them. Right? They're the enemies of the Israelites. Sick them. Look at verse 6. Thus saith the Lord, for three transgressions of Gaza... And for four. Isn't it amazing? We can turn on the news when you get home and hear about this very city. This is the city of the Philistines. It's in the southwest corner of Israel between Egypt and Israel. It's a little sliver of land on the Mediterranean Sea. And to this day, we're talking about something that was written 750, 60, 70, 80 years before the time of Christ. So 2,700 years ago, God was pronouncing judgment on this particular city. At that time, it was not a group of Arabs who lived there. It was the Philistines. Okay, So he says, I will send a fire on the wall of Gaza, which shall devour the palaces thereof. And I will cut off the inhabitant from Ashdod. You can go to Ashdod today. Ashdod is north of Gaza. It is a settlement in Judah today. But it was an ancient Philistine city. And him that holdeth the scepter from Ashkelon, another Philistine city. And I will turn mine hand against Ekron, another Philistine city. And the remnant of the Philistines shall perish, saith the Lord God. Isn't it interesting today? We call that area Palestine, which comes from the the word Philistine. But it's not the Philistines. They're Arabs who who live there today. And maybe Arab Persian cross of people, right? But... We don't have any Philistines today. We don't have any Hittites today. We don't have, we don't have any of these, these groups of people. We don't have Amorites or Ammonites or Girgashites. But you know who we do have? We have Israelites. And we have a land of Israel today. Isn't that interesting? So God judged the Philistines. And Amos told them it was going to happen. And he says, uh, I will set a fire on the wall. Oh, sorry. Uh... uh it says, I will, uh, and the remnant of the Philistines shall perish. Verse 8, saith the Lord God. At this point, the people of Israel are listening to the prophet, and they're going, yeah, sick them. They're loving it. That's two of, God's, of, of their enemies that God says he's going to punish. And they're going, yeah, yeah. Look at verse 9. Thus saith the Lord, for three transgressions of Tyrus, and for four. Okay, so Tyre is in Lebanon. This is Phoenicia. Remember, Jesus, after his Galilean ministry, took the twelve and they went to Tyre and Zidon. It's where he met 
the woman whose daughter was inhabited by the unclean spirit. Do you remember? We, we talked about it in the book of Mark. Well, that's the city he's talking about here. These are the Phoenicians. This is where Jezebel was from. Her daddy was a Phoenician king. These are worshipers of Baal up in what's modern day Lebanon. So he says, and for four, I will not turn away the punishment thereof because they delivered up the whole captivity to Edom. The Phoenician people had taken Israelites captive and handed them over to the Edomites and remembered not the brotherly covenant. How is there a brotherly covenant between Edom and Israel? Who's Edom? That's the descendants of Esau. And who's Israel? That's Jacob. He had his name changed. They're brothers. And so all the way through the scriptures, when you remember when Moses leads the children of Israel out of the land of Egypt, and then God's going to take them into the promised land, and they don't, they, they send the spies, the spies come back, they bring a bad report, God says, all right, you're going to wander in the wilderness. And so they go by another way, and they go up through the land of Edom. God says, you're not going to go to war against the Edomites, you're going to, you're going to go around them, you're going to pay them for food, you're going to pay them for water. Why? Because they're your brothers. Jacob and Esau are brothers. And so the Edomites should have had a brotherly covenant with Israel because they're kin. It's just like the Ammonites and the Moabites. Who do they come from? Abraham's nephew, Lot, married his two daughters. One of them had a child named Ammon. The other one had a child named uh, Moab. And that's where the Ammonites and Moabites come from. So all of these people... They were all kin at one point in time. So, back to verse uh, 9. He says, he says, Because they delivered up the whole captivity to Edom and remembered not the brotherly covenant. God is... Two, two things that God, throughout His Word, is very adamant about. Number one is brotherly love, Cain and Abel. Am I my brother's keeper? Love your brother, right? And the other one is covenant. If you make a covenant with someone, you're supposed to keep it. And Edom broke that covenant by buying slaves that were Israelites taken from, they were taken by the Phoenicians, the people of Tyre. It calls it Tyrus here. And they sold them to the Edomites. And so God says, because you did this, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to judge you. But I will send a fire, verse 10, on the wall of Tyrus, which shall devour the palaces thereof. So once again, this mighty Phoenician kingdom, God's going to bring it to crumbles. And the people of Israel said, yeah, get them, because these are their enemies. Look at verse 11. Thus saith the Lord for three transgressions of Edom. Now he's turning to the Edomites, the descendants of Esau. And for four, I will turn away the punishment thereof, because he did pursue his brother with the sword and did cast off all pity. And his anger did tear perpetually, and he kept his wrath forever. Do you remember when Jacob returned when he went to Laban and he got a wife and he wound up getting two wives and he spent 14 years working for Laban and, and, and he has all these children and he has all these flocks and he finally comes back. He's scared to death when he gets to the river as he's making his way back in and so he divides everybody up and sends part of them over across. What's he afraid of? His brother. Because here he comes with thousands of soldiers. And Jacob thinks he's going to have to fight his brother. That's the night Jacob wrestled with God, wrestled with the angel. He wrestled with him all night long. And finally, he said, all right, let me go. And he said, I won't let you go unless you bless me. And the angel said, okay, I've had enough of this. And he touched Jacob's thigh and crippled him. I mean, wiped him out for the rest of his life. He walked with a limp. But he said, I'm not, your name's not Jacob anymore. Now your name's Israel. Well, the next morning, his brother shows up with this huge army. And, but he doesn't want to fight. He wants to be friends. Jacob gives him all these gifts. He says, I got plenty. You don't need to give me these. No, no. I want you to have them. So they, they hug. They're brothers. It's all over. At one point in time, Esau wanted to kill Jacob because he cheated him. But, at, but by that point in time, he had forgiven him. So, so when he talks about this brotherly covenant, that's what he's talking about is these guys being brothers. And, and so here's the lesson. God wants you to get along with your brothers and sisters. 
He, he wants that. He wants there to be brotherly love in your family. So if you got beef with your brothers and sisters, go make up. Okay? So he says, uh, verse 11, Thus saith the Lord, for three transgressions of Edom and for four, I will not turn away the punishment thereof, because he did pursue his brother with the sword and did cast off all pity, and his anger did tear perpetually, and he kept his wrath forever. Now he's not talking about when Esau and Jacob met, because they did make up. He's talking about later. The nation of Edom took slaves that were Israelites, and they caught Israel at a time when they were they were weak, and they they did damage to them. Okay, so verse twelve, but I will send a fire upon Teman, that's a city of Edom, which shall devour the palaces of Bozra. Bozra. Anybody know what Bozra is? It's modern day Petra. You know what Petra is? It's a place in Jordan. You should look it up. If you ever get a chance, go there. You want to talk about one of the coolest things you've ever seen in your life. They carved a city into the sides of the cliffs of these mountains. And it is impressive. Okay? So verse 13 says, Thus saith the Lord. Oh, and by the way, what did the Israelites say when they heard this about Edom? Yeah! Sick them! Because they're their enemies. Look at verse 13. Thus says the Lord, For three transgressions of the children of Ammon, Descendant of Lot. Lot married one of his daughters. One of the children is Ammon. And for four, I will not turn away the punishment thereof because they have ripped up the women with child of Gilead that they might enlarge their border. Oh my goodness. The Ammonites had invaded Gilead along with <clears throat> Damascus. And not only did they kill the men who were fighting in the war, but they murdered the women, pregnant women. And he says, I saw it. I watched it happen. I hold you guilty for it, and I'm going to deal with it. Verse 14, But I will kindle a fire in the wall of Reba. That's a city of Ammon. And it shall devour the palaces thereof with shouting in the day of battle, with a tempest in the day of the whirlwind. And their king shall go into captivity, he and his princes together saith the Lord. Now most of these judgments that he's pronouncing is actually going to be brought about by who? The Assyrians. But not yet. Why? Because he just sent Jonah to preach to them and they repented. So they are they are not tearing up the world. They are evil, violent, uh, wrathful, beheading people, stacking the skulls up, uh, cruel, yanking people's tongues out uh, so that they had to starve to death so they couldn't eat. Uh, uh, just just cruel people. That's why Jonah didn't want to go preach to them. Jonah wanted them to be judged. He didn't want them to receive God's mercy. But God wanted to give Israel a little bit more time. So... And he also wanted to do what God, I believe, always does, and that is give everybody a shot. Even the cruelest, most awful Assyrians, he gave them a shot. So he sent Jonah, and they repented. And so you've got a whole generation of people who believe in God, listen to God, and repent of their sin. And they're gonna, you're going to meet them. You're going to meet some Assyrians in heaven that repented of that. Jesus tells us that. We looked at that last week in Matthew chapter 12. Okay? But this fire that he keeps, I'm going to kindle a fire there. There's going to be a fire on the wall. The palaces are going to fall. That's going to be the Assyrians. Because when the Assyrians head west, they're going to wipe out everybody. And so when the Israelites hear Amos come and, and give this message, what do they say? Yeah, sick them. Because the Ammonites are their enemies. Look at verse chapter 2, verse 1. Thus saith the Lord, for three transgressions of Moab. So you've got Ammon, uh, Edom, Ammon, and Moab are all south of Gilead on the east side of the Jordan and of the Dead Sea. And, and actually the plains of Moab, that's where Nebo is. That's where Moses went up and looked into the promised land. And so thus saith the Lord, for three transgressions of Moab and for four I will not turn away the punishment thereof because he burned the bones of the king of Edom into lime. So... So this is, this is a, a war between Moab and Edom. And yet God says, 
you, you know, you were so cruel. It wasn't enough just to just to, to, to put him to death. You had to burn his bone to desecrate this dead body. But I will send a fire upon Moab, and it shall devour the palaces of Kerioth, and Moab shall die with tumult and with shouting and with the sound of the trumpet, and I will cut off the judge from the midst thereof and will slay all the princes thereof with him, saith the Lord. And what's Israel saying? This shepherd just, this shepherd just walked in here. And he just pronounced judgment from God on all of our enemies. And so they say, yeah, sick them. Get them, Lord. Get those bad people. Look at verse 4. Thus saith the Lord, for three transgressions of Judah. Oh, no. Now we're back to God's people. But Judah, that's the southern kingdom. That's where Amos is from. So now Amos is talking about his own people. For, the, for three transgressions of Judah and for four, I will not turn away the punishment thereof because they have despised the law of the Lord. Number one thing. None of these other nations have the law of God. But Judah does. And you and I, we've studied what has happened. Remember, these is, this is during the days of Uzziah. Uzziah was actually a pretty good king. He was a proud king, but he was a pretty good king. So Judah has the law. They have the prophets they have Amos that's where he's, he's coming from and he says he says because they've despised the law of the Lord and have not kept his commandments and their lies cause them to err they like to believe lies after the which their fathers have walked but I will send a fire upon Judah and it shall devour the palaces of Jerusalem and what's Israel say yeah get them because it's not us it's our brothers down there in the south, but, you know, and Judah and, and Israel, they fought lots of wars against each other. But then look at verse 6, chapter 2, verse 6. This is where Amos gets right down to the nitty gritty. Thus saith the Lord, for three transgressions of Israel. Wait a minute, Amos. We were okay with Gaza and Damascus. No problem with Tyre and Edom and Ammon and Moab and even with Judah but but now you're meddling partner you go home you go back to your sheep herding you don't need to be telling us anything can't you just hear them I mean they don't want to hear what he has to say for three transgressions and for four <clears throat> of Israel I will not turn away the punishment thereof because they sold the righteous for silver human trafficking human trafficking did you know that right now the cartels of Mexico it is more valuable to traffic humans than it is to traffic drugs? It is the most lucrative business on the planet, the trafficking of human beings, moving them from one country to another, human slavery. Do not think for one second that anything has changed. They were selling human beings for money. And it still goes on to this day. And so here's my question for us. If God judged Israel for doing this 2,700 years ago, do you think that he's going to put up with it today? Of course not. I don't think so. He says, and the poor for a pair of shoes. They had literally traded a poor person for a pair of shoes. In other words, that, that's your value. I mean, I mean, it's one thing to sell someone for silver. Silver is actually a form of money or something but how much is a pair of shoes for well I don't know if they're Jordans in my lifetime I remember people being killed for a pair of shoes in the big cities uh, anybody know anybody have a pair of Jordans Anybody know what Jordans are y'all know what Jordans are yeah. all right praise God not just that's good yeah they're still cool he is the best basketball player that ever lived anyway <clears throat> those those shoes Kids would wear those shoes in the big cities, and if they got caught by the wrong group of people, there were some kids that got killed and had their shoes stolen. And that's what Israel was doing. They were selling a poor person for a pair of shoes. Verse 7, it says that pant after the dust of the earth on the head of the poor. In other words, they want what the poor has, even the dust on the head of the poor. That's what they want. Whatever the, the poor person owns, they want it. And so they want to take it away from them. And he says, And they turn aside the way of the meek, 
And a man and his father will go in unto the same maid to profane my holy name. So there's sexual immorality. Part of that was tied to their idolatrous worship. So they're ignoring the law of God. They are not showing justice. They're not taking care of the poor. They are exploiting and selling the poor as slaves. And it says in verse 8, And they lay themselves down upon clothes laid to pledge by every altar. And they drink the wine of the condemned in the house of their God. Remember, in Israel, that's where this worship of the golden calves is going on. And so that's what he's talking about. He says, he says they come to this, to this worship of the golden calves and they engage in sexual immorality. They would have temple prostitutes that were tied to this worship. And they are taking advantage of the poor and they're ignoring God's law. And so verse 9 says, Yet I destroyed the Amorite before them. Now, do you remember who the Amorites are? Ammonites, Amorites, Ananites, Ananias, Sapphira, all these names, right? The Amorites were the very first people that Moses and the Israelites engaged as they began to go toward the land of Israel. When they got to the land of Gilead or Bashan on the eastern side, they had to fight two giants, Og and Sihon. Remember them? And so, so they also had to fight the Amalekites, but, but that, was, that was a different deal. So, so we read about these. Well, I can tell you where we read about them. We read about them in... Numbers chapter 21. So let's turn there real quick. Numbers 21, verse 23. This is the thing about reading the prophets. How many names have we seen? Right? So you got to go back and you got to look up all of these names and see just what he's talking about. Here's what you don't want to do you don't want to yank one verse out of one of the prophets. And make it apply to you today because it probably doesn't. You're going to take it out of context if you do that. But if you'll if you'll look at the context of what he's talking about, he 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 jumps from talking about bringing judgment upon Israel to the Amorites. So let's see who they are. Numbers 21, verse 23. It says there, and Sihon. Well, let's go back to verse 21. Numbers 21:21. 21, 21. Israel sent messengers unto Sihon, king of the Amorites saying, Let me pass through thy land. We will not turn into the fields or into the vineyards. We will not drink of the waters of the well, but we will go along by the king's highway until we be past thy borders. This is the way they handled all of that land over there on the east. Moab, Edom, all of that. But, verse 23, Sihon would not suffer Israel to pass through his border, but Sihon gathered all his people together and went out against Israel into the wilderness. And he came to Jahaz and fought against Israel. And Israel smote him with the edge of the sword and possessed his land from Arnon unto Jabbok, even unto the children of Ammon, for the border of the children of Ammon was strong. Israel took all of these cities. Not only did they, uh, they do that, but uh, verse 33 says, And they turned and went up by the way of Bashan and Og, the king of Bashan went out against them, he and all his people, the battle of Edrei. The Lord said unto Moses, Fear him not, for I have delivered him into thy hand and all his people of his land, and thou shalt do to him as thou didst to Sihon, king of the Amorites, which dwelt at Hezbon. So they smote him and all his people until there was none left alive, and they possessed his land. Now, do you remember Og? Remember what the Bible says about him in Deuteronomy? It tells us how big his bed was, because Og was a giant. Okay? So these are the giants. These are the descendants of the Nephilim. And that we encountered that Moses encountered them. There were, there were many of them. This is what the spies said when they went into the land. They came back, they brought back the big cluster of grapes that it took two of them to carry. And they said, Man, it's a good land, it's great, but the people are as tall as the cedars. There were giants in the land, right? Caleb said, Doesn't matter. We can whoop them. 
But the rest of the people couldn't, they wouldn't do that. Okay, now look back to Amos chapter 2 and verse 9. And God says, look, he says, look what you're doing. And yet you need to remember, I dis- destroyed I the Amorite before them, whose height was like the height of the cedars. And he was strong as the oaks. I wiped out those giants and I will wipe you out too unless you repent. Yet I destroyed his fruit from above and his roots from beneath. In other words, I completely cut him off. You're not going to find any more Amorites because they completely wiped them out. Also, I brought you up from the land of Egypt. So now he's referring to the Exodus. So, so these are the people that came. These are the descendants of the people who came out of the Exodus. They're supposed to remember their God, but they've forgotten their God. They're worshiping false gods. They're worshiping idols. They're doing things that are disgusting. They are doing uh, uh, things that are unjust. They are cheating the poor. They are selling people. Okay, God says, I'm not going to put up with it. And if you don't think that I'm not strong enough to deal with you, just remember what I did to the giants. So he says, I brought you out of Egypt and led you 40 years through the wilderness to possess the land of the Amorite. I took that land from those people and I gave it to you. And I raised up your sons for prophets and your young men for Nazarites. Is it not even thus, O ye children of Israel, saith the Lord? But ye gave the Nazarites wine to drink. Remember, part of the Nazarite vow. Remember what the Nazarite vow is. They don't, don't cut their hair. They don't drink anything or eat anything. They don't eat any raisins, don't drink wine, don't drink grape juice, nothing. And they don't touch what? Dead body. Okay? So he says, I raised these people up, and what do you do? You gave the Nazarite wine to drink. In other words, you tempted these Nazarites to break their vow to me and commanded the prophets, saying, Prophesy not. You see, that's what Israel is held guilty of throughout the entire time. Don't prophesy. We don't want to hear it. Think of the prophet during Ahab's time, Micaiah. The the king of of, uh, uh, Judah came to be with with, uh, Ahab. I believe it was uh, King Jehoshaphat. And he said, let's go to war. So they bring in all these prophets. They even had this one dude, he had a pair of iron horns. You remember that? And he said, oh, king, you're going to push the Edomites with these horns. And, and Jehoshaphat's looking at all these clowns, and he says, do you have a real prophet here? Because he knew they were phony baloney TV preachers. So they said, oh, yeah, we got one, but I hate him. His name's Micaiah. He says, because he always says bad stuff about me. So he says, why don't we go listen to what he says? So they bring in Micaiah, and he's like, Oh, king, go to war, you'll win. You know? Ahab goes, All right, Micaiah, tell the truth. He says, If you go to war, you're going to die. He said, See? He hits Jehoshaphat. I told you. He never says anything good about me. So they throw him in jail. And sure enough, that's the day that Ahab is, says one of the archers shot an arrow at a venture. Right through the harness. Right in the perfect spot. The only spot it would have penetrated. Down he goes. And so Micaiah's right. But verse 12, this is what they did. They corrupted the godly people and they told the prophets, don't prophesy. We don't want to hear it. Verse 13, Behold, I'm pressed under you as a cart is pressed that is full of sheaves. In other words, you've got your truck loaded down till the leaf springs are about to, they're about to break. I, I, th- that's the burden that I feel when I look at you. I'm, I'm weighed down with this incredible burden. Therefore the flight shall perish from the swift, the strong shall not strengthen his force, neither shall the mighty deliver himself. You can't get out of this, Israel. I'm going to judge you, and, that, and it's going to happen. Neither shall he stand that handleth the bow, and he that is swift of foot shall not deliver himself, neither shall he that rideth the horse deliver himself. You can't outrun it, you can't fight it, When they come, you're going to fall. And he that is courageous among the mighty shall flee away naked in that day, saith the Lord. This is God's judgment upon Israel. So we're going to quit there because we're out of time. But uh, I want to, uh, that's pretty depressing, yeah? 
I mean, I mean, that's like, wow. We came to Bible study tonight, and all we heard was God's going to bring a fire. Here, here's here's what I, w- I want you to to take away from this. What had the people done to get to this point? Well, they had completely ignored God. They turned their back on God, and they'd worshipped false idols. We didn't quite make it there, but this is what God's calling them to right here. In the next chapter, He's going to say this. Can two walk together except they be agreed? And Israel is going the opposite direction. They do not agree with God. So what do you call it when you agree with God? You call it confession and repentance, which leads to faith. Or maybe faith leads to confession and repentance. Depending on whether we're Arminians or Calvinists, we can argue that out in the parking lot. But the bottom line is, is if I believe God and, and I'm going this way and God says you should be going that way, I will change my mind and I will line up with God so that I can walk together with Him because I must agree with God. If God and I do not agree, I'm wrong. And that's what Israel didn't want to admit. They didn't want to admit that they were wrong. And if you do that long enough, there's going to be consequences for it. So I just want to encourage you tonight. Agree with God quickly. Get on board with God's program and and line up your life with Him. And then, instead of hearing the words of judgment, you'll hear the words of blessing. Amen? Father, thank You for this evening. And thank you for the words of Amos. Help us, Lord, to understand them. There's a lot of names and places and, and uh, a lot of history. But God, we just pray your Holy Spirit will help us. We love you and we praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. God bless you. I love you. I'm glad you're here.